Okay. Jesus cleansing the temple. Any questions? Well, while you guys think of your questions, open your Bibles to Leviticus. Zeb Carpenter. Oh, there is a question. Oh, sorry. Was there you go? Was there any high priest that tried to stick up for Jesus? Was there anybody? Was there any voice there anywhere that tried to? Yes. Um, we know that uh, Nicodemus in John's Gospel does. Nicodemus has three appearances in John's Gospel. In chapter 3, he's in unbelief. Jesus says, you do not believe our testimony. So I've heard people try to turn Nicodemus into this hopeful... Op- no, he's, he's an unbeliever in John 3. However, in John, I think, 11 or 12, he actually sticks up for Jesus, and they're plotting against him, and he says, does our law condemn a man without hearing from him? And... Then he's one of the two people who petitioned to get Jesus' body and to bury him. So Nicodemus does. Pilate, three or four times, tries to release him. Like, just let me beat him and let him go, you guys. Um, but that's, that's really about it. I mean, can you think of anyone else in, in any leadership position sticking up for Jesus in the Passion Week? I, Pilate, in a wishy-washy kind of way. Nicodemus, that's all I can think of. Pilate's wife says, have nothing to do with this man because she has that dream that troubles her. Yep, yep. Mm. Okay, other questions? I mean, I'll, I'll tell you the things Zeb pointed out. One of the things we didn't deal with because when you're studying these things, there's different ways you can approach it. Um, my, my old pastor, John MacArthur, he likes to harmonize the gospel. So he'll teach through Luke, but he'll bring everything Matthew and Mark and John have to bear on the, as well. And that, that's a legitimate aspect of study. I, I've been focusing on Luke and what Luke's focusing on. But one of the things that you get when you harmonize the four Gospels is Jesus did not cleanse the temple once, but twice. Because in John chapter 2, just after Jesus' first signed miracle, he cleanses the temple. So what is, Zeb came up to me and he said, what's the significance of Jesus cleansing the temple twice? Well, let's turn to Leviticus 14. Verse 43. Leviticus 14, 33. So this is about a law for some disease, mold, or growth, corruption, invading a house. Okay? So the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, verse 33, when you come into the land of Canaan, which I give you for possession, and I put a case of leprous disease in the... And don't, and don't think of leprosy like Hansen's disease. Leprosy is any sort of... Um, for skin, it's any sort of irritation, rash, scab, oozing, pussing. And then the same thing can apply to, to wood into a house, a patch of really nasty mold. Have you ever seen like black mold in the house today? Something like that. Um, uh, then, okay, the land leprous disease in a house in the land of your possession, then he who owns the house shall come and tell the priest, there seems to me to be some case of disease in my house. And the priest shall command that the, they empty the house before the priest goes in to examine the disease, lest all that is in the house be declared unclean. This is part of Israel's sort of civic law. We, the same thing that you might call a house inspector or call a health inspector and Could you guys check this thing out? We're not sure what this is. I've actually done that. Had somebody check on some, a spot and, you know, is this... That black death stuff? No, okay. Um, then the priest shall command that they empty the house before the priest goes in to examine. 37, he shall examine the disease. And if the disease in the walls of the house with greenish or reddish spots, and if it appears to go deeper than the surface, then the priest shall go out of the house to the door of the house and shall shut the house seven days. And the priest shall come again on the seventh day and look. And if the disease has spread in the walls of the house, then the priest shall con- Man, that they take out the stones in which is the disease and throw them into an unclean place outside the city. And he shall have the inside of the house scraped all around and the plaster that they scrape off and they shall pour out in the unclean place outside the city. And they shall take other stones and put them in the place of the stones. And he shall take the other plaster and the plaster of the house. If the disease breaks out again in the house, so that's the first offense. You, you, if it's really there, that's what you do. You cleanse it. 
If the disease breaks out again in the house and he has taken out the stones and scraped the house and plastered it, then the priest shall go and look. And if the disease has spread in the house, if it is a persistent leprous disease in the house, if it is unclean, then he shall break down the house, its stones and timber and all the plaster of the house, and he shall carry them out of the city to an unclean place. Moreover, whoever enters the house while it is shut up shall be unclean till evening. Whoever sleeps in the house shall wash his clothes. So what Zeb was saying is, interestingly enough, the Levitical priests, if there's a corrupted house... Look at it twice, and they cleanse it, give it a thorough cleansing the first time, and then they come back, and they check on it again, and they give it a thorough cleansing, and if it still remains, they knock the house down. Interestingly enough, what does Jesus do? The beginning of his ministry, he goes and he cleanses the temple. Three, three and a half years later, he comes back, does it again, and then he prophesies its destruction. So, anyway, that was, Zeb's not here, but that was his insight. I thought that was pretty cool. So, Dan Barth. He's like, I could paint that. (laughs) There's a little bit of leprous disease here. We'll just use an extra coat. A couple of weeks ago, you mentioned harmonizing Mm. 1938, Peace in Heaven. Yeah. My suggestion was um, that Jesus' death, this is what I I tried to touch on on, on on Resurrection Sunday on Easter, not only brings us peace, but it resolves the tension in heaven that God has already extended the benefits of this sacrifice to people like Abraham and David. There are people who are guilty, guilty as hell, in heaven. Paul's language, this was to put Jesus forward publicly that he might, um, since, since he had formerly passed over former sins, that God might be just and justifier. So the tension of, of the problem of evil, not... God, why do you let these bad things happen to these nice people? But God, how have you not destroyed every human being in existence is resolved by Jesus' death. So this potential, well, not potential, this real tension that God says, I'm righteous. And I, and I, I mean, go to, um, go to Exodus 34. The tension's right there. Um, in Exodus 34, Moses goes up in the mountain and he wants God to um, reveal himself to him, show me your glory. God says, okay, I'll tell you my glory. I'll make my goodness pass by you. Exodus 34, 6. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. Well, then how do you forgive iniquity and sin, Lord, if you by no means clear the guilty? God makes this bold claim that he simultaneously says, I forgive sin, and I don't let any guilty people go. That problem of evil that God has already forgiven people is resolved on the cross. That, that's what I was suggesting. I don't know if that's absolutely what Luke has in mind, but it was a nice tie-in for, for Easter. But Jesus' death resolves any apparent unrighteousness in God, not for letting bad things happen to us, but for letting good. That's, that's what I was suggesting. Um, but thank you for your attentiveness. And did you have something else, or is that that it? That's it. Okay. This man was listening two weeks ago. Anybody else? Uh, my question ties in with what we just talked about, but also the the application part of the sermon today, and I'm not sure I can state it clearly, I mean my question, but basically it has to do with we are the church, we are his body here on earth. Yes. How do we be welcoming and and take care of the poor and the downcast and the outcasts and everything and still like for the LGBT community still um, maintain what we just heard you know God has mercy but does not forgive the guilty that's 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 a great question to which I say go back to Isaiah 56 um and you, and you want to be careful because you don't want to spiritualize things. If, if I'm going to try to make an application from a physical building in Isaiah to the church, I want to be careful in my steps lest we just start allegorizing everything. 
and, I, and I'd argue, first, how you get there, and while you're turning to Isaiah 56, it's the nature of a temple to be fundamentally where God and man meet and sin is dealt with. So even in the garden, there's a sort of, in a sense, people have seen God and man meeting, and God provides the skins of the animals. But then clearly the tent of meeting, which is the next step on the path of temple, is where Moses met with God face to face as a man meets the man, and sacrifices are offered. Then they put up the tent at Shiloh, and what again happens? Man and God meet, sin is dealt with, and that goes on. So ultimately in Jesus then, as the temple of God, this is where man and God meet and sin is dealt with. The church now is called the temple of God. Why? Because we present the gospel. This is where man and God meet. Not because we're doing the mediation, but this is people come. And then what's amazing is the new heavens and the new earth, according to the book of Revelation, there is no temple. Why? For God is with his people. So there's a biblical theology, a development of this temple theme. And so what's common to temple is man and God meeting, sin being dealt with, but also this notion of everyone who wants to be faithful to God being welcome. But it's that second part, I think, helps answer your question. So when you read this, it's not just every old eunuch and every old foreigner who's welcomed. Let's read this. Verse 5, verse 3 of Isaiah 56. Do not... Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. Let not the eunuch say, behold, I'm a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast to my covenant. And he gives the promise. So on the one hand, we want to be really careful that we are not in any way being unwelcoming to people based on their race, their age, their where they're from, their socioeconomic class, and there's lots of subtle ways that we can do that. We need to be careful of. Um, however, there's no compromise about. Do, do you want to know about be faithful to and follow the Lord of the Bible? You are welcome. Come in with us, right? No, I want to do my own thing. Okay, we love you, but. <laughs> You're not, you're not part of this group then. You can't be part of this group if you don't want to follow the God who wrote this book. And so that's put in plain here. So we do want to be careful that we're not subtly excluding people or giving signals or signs that people who are from certain um, backgrounds, certain um, statuses, eight, whatever. And that's one of the reasons why I don't like you know, youth church and black church and white church. I mean, the book of Ephesians, the dividing wall is taken down. There's neither Jew, there's neither Greek, there's neither male nor female, nor slave nor free. He's made one new man in Christ. And so the multi-generational, multinational, multi-ethnic makeup of the church is part of its glory. And so churches that work against that are working against the glory of God in the church. Part of what makes the church wonderful is there's no more dividing wall. Well, except where we put it up. And... You know, and so I know there's churches like the you know the young people, the rocks are. I think it's a bad idea. It's working against those themes. So on the so on the one hand, we we should carefully think through are there ways that we subtly are are communicating certain types of people would be less than welcome. You know, no, and you can do that if if everything you talk about is family, family, family ministries, then the singles and the people without kids. I'm going to learn slowly, I guess we're second class. You've got to be careful you don't do that. Or you can be all about the young hipsters and let people, other people know oh, we're not as welcome. So there's lots of ways we can do this. We need to be careful about it. But it's always to those people who want to be faithful to the God of the Bible. We, we don't compromise on that. We don't, we don't say, well, I mean, we want to love them. And you're welcome to come and sit with us and sit and listen. But if you want to be part of us, if you want to be this family then you need to be striving after the same God and faithfulness to him and his word that we are. And that's non-negotiable. So yeah, wherever you find people who are trying to be faithful and hold to God's covenant, we, we need to welcome them and we need to make them feel at home. But, but so yeah, so even in the passage in Isaiah, it's clear, it's not just every eunuch and every foreigner. You know, you worship another God, that's fine, come on in. no. And in fact, the passage in Jeremiah makes that clear that there's this hypocrisy. Who's not welcome? Hypocrites, idolaters, people who can talk. I mean, go to, go to Jeremiah, right? What's the rebuke there? Um, 
Verse 7, Jeremiah 7, 8. Behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, go after other gods that if you have not known, and then come and stand before me? You want to play games? You want to go whore after other gods? You want to go oppress your neighbor and do all this? And, and Christians struggle with sin. These are people who are embracing this, unrepentedly doing these things. And yet they somehow think, as long as I show up on Sunday, or in their case, it would be the Sabbath on Saturday, I'm good. That's what they claim. Um, the Lord, we are, verse 10, then come and stand before my house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered. Praise God, I'm forgiven. So I can go back to my lying, cheating, adultery, whatever. And those dogs don't hunt. And so that's the rebuke Jesus is bringing against the Pharisees. They are embracing and comfortable with their sin. They're not fighting it. They've made peace with it. And yet they think that because they participate in the temple worship system, somehow they're going to be safe and secure. And nope. <laughs> um, so, so on the other hand, what's Jesus rebuking? That type of hypocrisy. Um, he's not fooled. It's, it's easy enough to show up on a Sunday morning and put on a good show and talk a good talk, but the rest of the week is where the walk comes out. And so the rebuke in Jeremiah is to the hypocrites who have a pretense and a facade of religion and yet are, and here's the key, unrepentedly going after these things, doing these things, versus the foreigner and the eunuch who are holding fast to God's covenant who are welcome. So that's, that's, that's the contrast. Um, and I think that helps resolve the tension. What do you, what do, you do with that? Um, so wherever we meet people, rather than assuming anything, I mean, somebody shows up with a rainbow shirt on with whatever letters, and the letters they add to it, it's getting longer, right? Question mark's the new one? Okay. Um, I wouldn't assume anything, but you're trying to quickly find out, do you want to know the God of the Bible? Do you want to follow the God of the Bible? If you do, great. We can talk and work stuff out. If not, well, we love you, but now at least I know for now you're not part of this body, and you're not part of the, 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 the Lord's fold yet. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a good, good, good question, Dev. Any, anyone want to bounce off of that or any other questions? Candy. So how do you talk to somebody that openly lives a lifestyle that is contrary to God's, and then at the same time is going... Easter was great, Jesus is risen, mm. praise the Lord. Right. What do you say? Um, well, we want to be careful because we don't know hearts, um, but there is biblical precedent for looking at fruit, right? So I don't know anyone's heart. I don't know what God's doing. I don't know what struggles or what successes they're having. But Jesus does talk about knowing a tree by its fruit. But specifically where I grew up, I'll just give you from my background, um, I would have said I was a Christian at an early age. I would have been able to articulate the gospel clearly and accurately. I prayed a prayer and asked Jesus into my life. Um, and yet, I, I think I've told this before, I remember being at a University of New Hampshire keg party outside, vomiting. I drunk so much, and someone saw the little crucifix my sister had given me. and said, are you a Christian? I said, yeah, just a bad one. And I thought that was a category I could live in. Um, you turn to Deuteronomy 29. Now, Deuteronomy, you might say, okay, that's the Old Testament. Hebrews 12 quotes this. And so we're going to jump from Deuteronomy 29 to Hebrews 12. This is a warning in Deuteronomy 29. It's the closing of the closing of Moses' ministry. And he lays out these warnings in, in Deuteronomy 29. Promises the blessing and the curse. And let's pick it up in verse 18. Now, the phrase Hebrews is going to read, which everyone, not everyone, but so many commentaries have read get wrong. You know, in Hebrews 12, the root of bitterness, it's not about quarreling and bitter feelings among people in the body. That, that's a bad thing, and there are other passages that talk about that. When Hebrews 12 talks, beware lest there be a root of bitterness spring up among you and many be defiled. It's, it's referencing Deuteronomy 29. We'll, we'll go to Hebrews 12 in just a minute, but I want to read Deuteronomy 29 first. So here's the warning, okay? Verse 18. Beware... Lest there be among you a man or a woman, so an individual, or clan or tribe or larger groups. We're, we're on our guard against individuals and groups whose heart is turning away 
from the Lord your God to go and serve other gods of the nations. That's the broad warning. So what's the warning? We're looking for individuals or groups of individuals whose hearts are turning from God. How will those, what, what's, do we get any more description of what that looks like? Um, beware, lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. Now there's what Hebrews 12 grabs. One, and then verse 19 gives a much more clear description of what that actually looks like. Broad terms, their hearts turning from serving the God to other gods. One who, when he hears the words of this sworn covenant, blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall be safe, though I walk in the stubbornness of my own heart. So you're hearing Moses lay out the covenant. And even though you're not keeping the covenant, even though you're not following God in the covenant, you're saying, I'm going to receive the covenant blessings despite all that. What it looks like in modern vernacular is a Christian saying, yeah, I know this is sinful, but it's okay. Jesus will forgive me. It, it, and willful, unrepentant sin and the sin we struggle with are worlds apart. The p- sin you've made peace with, the sin you say, I know it's wrong, but I don't care. That's your attitude, but it's okay because Jesus will forgive me, so we're all good. That's who the warning directed on. Read verse 19 again. One who, when he hears the words of this sworn covenant, blesses himself, reassures himself in his heart, saying, I shall be safe, though I walk in the stubbornness of my own heart. What will be the consequence of that? This will lead to the sweeping away of the moist and dry alike. The Lord will not be willing to forgive him. But rather, the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will smoke against that man, and, against this, and the curses written in this book will be settled upon him, and the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven, and the Lord will single him out from all the tribes of Israel for calamity in accordance with all the curses of the covenant written in this book of the law. And the next generation of children to rise up after you, and the foreigners who come from a far land will say when they see the afflictions of that land and the sickness with which the Lord has made it sick, the whole land burning out with brimstone and salt nothing sown and nothing growing where no plant can sprout and overthrown like Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zibion, which the Lord overthrew in his anger. All the nations will say, why has the Lord done thus to the land? What caused the heat of his great anger? And the people will say it was because they abandoned the covenant. Now go to Hebrews 12. And Hebrews is alternating in, the, in the, the book of Hebrews between lifting up Christ and his superior and exclusive roles. He's better than the angels. He's better than Moses. His covenant is better. His sacrifice is better. His priesthood is superior and better. But in with those Christ is better motifs are warnings about not persevering, falling away, going back to the temple worship, and here's one of the stronger ones. Verse 12, 12. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. Now, that's a warning you don't hear in many churches. People who call yourself Christian, see to it that none of you fails to obtain what you believe you have. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness, which is your link to Deuteronomy 29, so what does it look like when someone fails to obtain? They hear, they hear the gospel every day, and they bless themselves in their heart, saying, I'll be forgiven even though I go stubbornly in my own way. That no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it, many become defiled. That, and then he gives the perfect example. Is that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. So apparently Esau thought something, I'll sell my birth right now and I'll get it back later. And Esau was unable to bring himself to repentance, even though he sought it with tears. It's a terrifying picture of you, you, you departed and you're unable to return. So that's a pretty dire warning. And I don't know, Candy, when anyone's crossed that line. 
You know, because anytime we stubbornly walk away, that could be, in some sense, be the beginning of the end. That could be the beginning of showing you're never his. Not that you're losing your salvation when that happens, but John and First John talks about those who departed from us because they were never of us, for if they'd been of us, they would not have departed. Um, and so I don't know when that lies crossed, but I know that when people are embracing willful sin is a terrifying thing. It should be a terrifying thing. Nothing, nothing disheartens me more when I talk with other Christians. It's usually not about them. It's about people they love, family members, who are caught up in something. Oh, it's okay, though, you know, because I know they're a believer. If they're not following Christ right now, we can know no such thing. Like, we can hope they're a believer. Maybe they're a believer. But if the tree is bearing thorns... Who knows? At best, who knows, right? So there's a warning, there's a fearful exhortation, and there's a promise that even now, for any of us, I, mean, I talked to somebody um, two, a week or two ago who, who t- confessed to struggling with wondering if they'd c- committed the unpardonable sin. And my, my counsel to that is always, rather than chasing your tail, wondering if I crossed the line, have I gone too far, have I hardened my heart, if you can get yourself back to a place of contrition and repentance, you're good. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. God never turns away a broken and contrite heart. Esau's problem is he couldn't get back to that. He couldn't find a place to repent, though he sought it with tears. So rather than chasing your tail, have I gone too far, get back to that contrite, broken place before God, and you're good, right? Um, the, the problem is what we're warned is at a certain point, you can't. Israel crossed that line. It's now hidden from your eyes, Jesus says. Would that you had known what made for peace on this day, but now it is hidden from your eyes. You've, Israel crossed that line. I don't know what that line is. Um, I, I would have thought, in fact, partly as I started reading my Bible and I became a Christian, my big fear was that I'd cross. You can read, I got this like, journal of notes. I'm going to get to Hebrews. I got about two chapters in and they skipped to the next book because it was freaking me out too much. Like, I don't want to read this right now. Um, I don't want to hear that maybe I've, you know, because I was the guy who trampled and said in my heart, blessed myself in my heart, I'll be okay, I'm a bad Christian. I'm a immoral, pot-smoking, drunkard, carousing, debaucherous Christian. But isn't it great because we're not saved by works, we're saved by grace. Woo! And I was, I was blessing myself, saying I'm going to receive the covenant blessings even though I was walking in the stubbornness of my own heart. And in God's mercy, apparently I had not gone that far he would have been completely just. I mean, when I read this, my first thought is, what if that's me? What if I'm not able to repent like Esau? I mean, I was terrified I was going to be Esau. And in God's amazing mercy, I wasn't. I could have been. I should have been. I mean, it would have been just of him to do that. So I don't know where that is. God's mercy is great, but it's a serious warning. And that's part of why we do discipline, because we're telling people, we love you, but we are scared for you. And if you won't take it seriously, <laughs> we, we can't pretend nothing's going on. Um, so Paul talks in 1 Corinthians 5 about um, expelling them so that their soul might be saved in the day of Christ Jesus. So ultimately, discipline's done with a redemptive goal. This person's not taking this seriously. I think it's okay. It's not okay. Um, your house is on fire. Wake up. So that's my medium-sized, I can't say short answer, so it's my medium-sized answer to your question. Um, anything else on this or anything related? Bueller, Bueller. Oh, Lee Carpenter. Well, I had a couple of ladies come to my house yesterday, nice-looking ladies, and talking about how I could be happy with God. And the weird thing is, she said, here's this verse from the first book of Psalms. And I thought, what? <laughs> anyway, it Psalms really is in books. I looked it yeah. up. <laughs> anyway, it's the first Psalm about blessed is the man. And mm-hmm. anyway, and... I, you know, I didn't, even, I didn't invite them in, and it was, they were Jehovah's Witnesses, ah. and, and it's like, after they left, I felt terrible, because, you know, they're, they're basically going to hell, probably, I mean, but I, like I say, I, I can't judge them, but I didn't... No, no, no. What people is, who are actively proselytizing false religion yeah. Are, yeah. are currently headed to hell. Right. That may not be where they end up because God might intervene, but I, I can feel yeah. pretty comfortable when you're actively a proponent for, an apologist for, an evangelist for false religion. Yeah, yeah. you're playing for the other team. Well, L- I, don't, I don't know. What do you do? Just say, no, thanks, bye. I mean, I don't do the God bless you. I, I know that I don't want God to bless what they're doing. And Let's go to Jude. 
I don't think it's a one-size-fits-all answer. So 2 John talks about not well. If anyone comes, then you, well, we'll go to, let's go to 2 John, then Jude, okay? We're not going to vanilla John. We're going to 2 John. Um, okay. 2 John. It's, if you missed it, it's because it's one page. But if you start at Revelation and work back, you should find it. 2 John, verse 9. So you don't need to say chapter. There's, there's only one chapter. So you just, 2 John 9. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ. Here's your question. Here's your answer to your question. Lee. Does not have God. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching is both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. And the context there is that itinerant preachers re- relied upon local hospitality. Um, so, I mean, you can answer the door type of thing, but certainly you're not helping these people on their way, you're not giving them a meal. You know, um, now go to Jude. So there's just, there's just an instruction like don't participate, don't help them, don't give them, I'll be praying for you, God bless you. No, no, and that that's part is right. Now Jude, the book right before Revelation, um, says this in verse 20. Actually, go back to 17, verse 17 of Jude. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles and our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last times, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who leads, that leads to eternal life. And then, and I don't have time to f- fully, I don't know where I'm prepared to fully unpack this now, but John MacArthur did a great job. Um, he taught through Jude, Jude um, when I was there, so you can look it up. Um, he argues, I think convincingly, what we're about to read are categories of those false teachers. So when we heard about these false teachers who don't have the spirit in verse 17 through 19. And now, have mercy on those who doubt. So you got doubting. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy of fear, even hating the garment stained by the flesh. Garment stained by the flesh is not a very accurate translation. It's soiled undergarment. So here's three levels of interaction with people. And MacArthur argues, and I, and I think convincingly, that we're dealing with three sort of types of or levels of, of false teachers, of people in false religion. So there are some I, who, who are just caught up in it. I mean, this might be somebody who just, you know, I met a guy who was doing street evangelism in New York City um, when I was at Word of Life, and he had just become a Mormon because his wife was, and he had to become a Mormon to become, get married to her. And... He didn't know much about it. I'd say he's the one who doubts. He's, he had questions. He's like, yeah, I just got ordained in the order of Melchizedek, he told me. I took him to Hebrews and showed me there's no vacancies. Um, well, Hebrews, I know. The other priest died. And so I had to get replaced. But he holds his office forever. I said, do you think there's a vacancy opening up? Because I don't. And, and he was literally like, that's a good point. I mean, he really was not fully on board. He was a Mormon, largely a name only. All right? So I would sort of view that as that first class, those who doubt. Um, then snatch others from the fire, and others show mercy with fear, even hating the garment stained by the flesh. And so some of these people fully know what they're doing. I mean, they're just evil. Um, others are completely deceived. And so, so you've got, on the one hand, this sort of range in dealing with false religion from here's this doubting, confused person, I'm going to just straight evangelism normal, to this other thing where literally how would you, you know, my wife... The other, no, my mom asked me to go get a dog toy that the dog had defecated on. And I very, gi- yes, mom, um, I very gingerly picked it up by the clean corner, you know, and just sort of, she had a bag, so I wanted to put it in, we put it in the bag. Right? And, and anyone who's changed a diaper knows what that's like or dealt with, you know, uh, some sort of nastiness in their home. 
And so there's some people, that's who we interact with. You're a contaminant, dangerous, foul thing. And now that's mean you're being rude or a jerk. It just means, like, look, if you want to talk about the gospel, great. If not, we got nothing else to talk about. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, we're not, we're not, one second, we're not, this is very ginger treatment. I'm not having casual interactions with, you know, uh, some super high level whatever. And so there, there's a range. So part of my answer would be you got to figure out where they're at. Usually when you meet Mormons or JWs, there's the old timer and there's the fresh person. And my advice is when you deal with Mormons, deal with the, the fresh one. Connie, microphone. No. Oh, no, microphone. Well, we shouldn't ever treat someone, um, well, you know, just like, like you said, they uh, don't want to touch them or anything. But uh, they do change their ways to get you to think they're okay. Right. Throughout the years we've been, uh, we've been Christians, they started out and you had no doubt they were wrong. But it keeps getting better. You know, they're, they're gets cr- closer to Christianity, but there's always something like right. there's no Christ is not risen or he's not God. And, and so the basic thing, but they, they're sneaky, so you have to be aware yeah. because they're trying to they're trying to get you to go there, and, and we know in our hearts and in our lives and all that God is, um, God is God, and there's right. no, and Jesus is God, and you just can't um, take it, I mean, I know you can sit there and argue with somebody, and some people do, but uh, I guess a long time ago, I kind of read that in Jude, but if, if the you know, don't welcome them into your home, but you can stand at the front door and talk, <laughs> I guess, right. or outside or something. Right. But Well, and all I'm trying to get at is I think you need what's, what Paul said, know how to season your words with salt so you'll know how to answer every man. There isn't a static way to answer everybody. Um, they're, they're, you, deal with pe- you deal with the person. My whole person deals with your whole person. And so you try to figure out where they're at. And when you've got somebody steeped in and there's no openness to the gospel, they just want to talk about their religion, then good day, sir. Politely, but I, no, no, thank you. Um, where you think there might be some openness or some confusion or some, you know, sure, give and take, that's a different thing. When you've got somebody who's like that guy I'm talking about who's just totally confused. Yeah, I'm a Mormon, and I have no idea what that means. Um, that's another thing. And so it's not as simple as here's how you deal with the Mormon missionaries because they'll be of all shapes, sorts, and, and types. Um, and you never are rude. You're never um, condescending. But yeah, my my, if I meet somebody who's you know some somebody totally set on that stuff, I, I don't have a whole lot. To say. I mean, I, I had tea with somebody once who was basically claiming to be a Christian. I think he was Episcopal or something, and he was he was championing the LGBT stuff. anyway. And a friend, a mutual friend, tried to get us together to talk, and within two minutes. We don't have much to talk about. <laughs> and so we drank our tea and we went our way and it was peaceful and all, but, you know, it was, okay, you're just here to try to convert me. You're not here to talk. Okay, I'm not going to argue with you. Um, so, I mean, I'm good at arguing, but I, at least that day God gave some grace and I didn't. Um, anyway, thoughts, questions, further Ron Ludwig. I read this week that um, a new term that is being kind of floated around to um, allow people to excuse themselves from really standing up for something is if you ask them about their faith, they go, well, I'm in Christ. Hmm. And then if you uh, attempt to pursue their belief any further, their response is, well, yeah, but I'm in Christ. And so it's kind of a way to um, dodge anything controversial and really take a stand. Mm. So um, I don't know if anybody's encountered that around here. but I haven't encountered that, but there's nothing new under the sun. In Isaiah, their dodge was the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, right? I mean... Um, 
and, and nowadays you hear people, no creed but Christ. You ever heard that one? That itself is a creed. It's just a woefully insufficient one, but that, that is a creed. Um, and so we got to define our terms. It used to be, when I was growing up, the Mormons clearly understood, and I'm not trying to pick on the Mormons, they're just a good example. The Mormons clearly understood themselves as a separate religion, and so those, those commer- I could still almost sing the song that they had, and they'd show all these helpful people doing helpful things, the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. And then about 10 years ago, they made this shift where now they want to be viewed as a denomination of Christianity. And so, like the last Mormon I talked to, I was in Laconia, New Hampshire, outside of Green Laws Music, and it took me 20 minutes of talking to him before he'd agree that we disagreed on just about anything. Well, then, sure enough, Jesus used to be an angel, and good works are necessary for salvation and all of that. But for the first 15 minutes or so, it was, he had so co-opted our terms that unless you, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? You'd think we believe the same thing. Oh, we believe in salvation by faith through grace? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And so, again, what you mean by that, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved, but if you think that chair is the Lord Jesus Christ, you won't be. It's not a magic saying. It's not a, it's not a, a mantra. It's not, um, this isn't like a, like a spell that you cast. It, it, the content has to be there. So, yeah, what you mean by things is important. So, yeah, so people have always tried to dodge by throwing out some sloganeering theology, you know, um, I mean, I, I've met tons of people who, oh, yeah, Jesus is my personal Savior. Great. What does that mean? I mean, that, and you want to do it in a way that doesn't sound like that would have sounded, where's Carol, snarky? That would have sounded snarky. But no, you want to engage in a conversation. What do they mean by that? You know, um, and for a lot of people, I know what that means is I made a decision or a prayer sometime back in my life that was significant to me, and now I do whatever I want. I mean, I, so I, like, I've come to, when I talk to people about people they know and their salvation, I don't say they saved, I say they're following Christ. Are they bearing fruit? You know what I mean? That's what I'm interested in. Not, because otherwise I'll find out what they did when they were four, you know, 12 years old at Christian camp one summer, which may or may not be real. But I tell you one thing, if they got saved at Christian camp when they were 14, they'll be bearing fruit now. So that, that's usually what I'm more interested in. Are they following Christ? Are they, are they bearing fruit? One of the things I'll try to do, I don't, not that I get interviewed or asked very often, but I'd encourage you, point them to the Bible. I'll say, look, I'm a Bible-believing Christian, and I read the Bible, and here's what I see it saying. And they say, that's wrong. I'm like, well, I think that's what the Bible says. And what I'm trying to do is get them, to, well, the Bible doesn't say that. I think it does. <laughs> take up your issue with the Bible. Don't take up your issue with me. I'm, this may, you, know, you believe that this is wrong? This may shock you. But I'm a Christian, and I believe the Bible. That's what Christians have always said. And I'm, my understanding, my reading of the Bible says that this is what it says. And I'm trying to get, I want to make it clear the authority is this, not me. Um, so that's one tip I'd give is point them. Look, my, my understanding, my reading, the Bible seems pretty clear to me. If you, if you disagree with me, there's only seven clobber texts. Let's take a look at them. You know, uh, get them in the scripture, but you don't need to take the the full front of the attack, you can, the, the scripture can handle it. Um, look, I, I'm just, that's what I try to do when I talk to some of my more liberal friends. I'm just trying to read my Bible like Jesus. I'm just trying to, if the Bible says that's what I want to do, this is what I think it says, you know? Um, but yeah, there's always going to be a cop-outs and ways to try to cop out of things. Absolutely. Five minutes. Oh, whoa, whoa, microphone. This yes. should be pretty easy. Yeah. But <clears throat> before I had my full listening ears on this morning, <laughs> I think you said Ebenezer, or is it a place or a person? I it was not familiar you with that Nicodemus? word. You said Nicodemus? No. You said that too, but Ebenezer. Nebuchadnezzar. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I yeah. do not okay. even know. Okay, no, no. Perfect, perfect. This is great. I'll give you the brief history of Israel. Serena, no, 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 no. Absolutely. But they... I won't, probably won't know all the hand signs. I probably won't know all the hand signs. But no, actually with the youth group, my, my wife's dad has this great thing um, where he teaches the entire overview of the Old Testament history in, in 10 minutes. But the short version is this, right? So God calls Abraham from Ur of the Chaldees. The Chaldeans 
become the Babylonians. So the Chaldeans and the Babylonians are synonymous. So he's actually calling Abraham out of the very people who will one day destroy Israel. Um, He calls Abraham, makes a nation of him. They go down to Egypt. Um, Then they come up uh, in in the Exodus. They enter Canaan, and they settle in the land. And so Israel's in the land, and they have a series of judges where the people rebel, trust God, rebel, God sends a deliverer, and then they rebel, and then they cry out for help, and that goes on. And finally, they want a king. God gives them a king, Saul, then David. David has a son, Solomon. Solomon has a son, Rehoboam, and Rehoboam splits the kingdom in two. So now the nation of Israel is the divided kingdom. So whenever you see the prophets talking about Israel and Judah, they're talking about that divided kingdom. And they go on for a while like that. And the southern, the northern tribes have nothing but bad kings. The southern tribes have mostly bad kings. So God warns the northern tribes, and they don't repent. And so Sennacher, Shalmaneser V, sorry, Shalmaneser V, the Assyrian, comes and gobbles up the ten tribes and takes them away, and they never really heard from again. There's some stragglers. That land becomes the Samaritans. So the Samaritans of Jesus' day are the leftovers from what um, Shalmaneser left who intermarried with the Canaanites and had a bastardized version of Judaism that only recognized the books of Moses. Why? Because the northern tribe of the northern nation of Israel had made an alternate site of worship. And prior to entering the land, Deuteronomy just talks about the place that your Lord will pick. But after you get past that, it starts being very clear it's Jerusalem. So if you want to maintain a Samaritan-centric worship on Mount Nabal, it's Mount Nabal, yeah, he makes the bull. Someone will, okay, I forget where he made it. Isn't it Mount Nebo? Is it Mount Nebo? Anybody? Jacob? Anyway, he sets up an alternate set of worship because that's what the Samaritan woman, this mountain or the other mountain, right? So Deuteronomy doesn't specify where the place is. So they keep the first five books of Moses, and that's it. And they syncretized it with the Canaanite religions, and that's the Samaritans. And then God warns the southern two tribes of Israel, I mean, of Judah and of Benjamin, and they don't listen. And so that's when Nebuchadnezzar the Babylonian comes. So the ten tribes of the north get taken away by Shalmaneser the Assyrian. And then, and this is who Jeremiah is writing to, warning. Isaiah predicts it as well. Isaiah so the order of the prophets, you have Isaiah, and then after Isaiah, you have Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel as contemporaries. And there's actually intertextuality where they're aware of each other. So Daniel has read Jeremiah and knows that it's going to be 70 years. So it's, it's pretty cool that they're, even though they're geographically spread apart, their ministries overlap. And so Jeremiah warns Israel, don't fight Nebuchadnezzar. God's going to let him win. God's going to let him win. Ezekiel lets them know when Nebuchadnezzar defeats you, he will not have defeated Yahweh because Yahweh abandoned ship a while back. And so that's where we had the visions of the glory departing the city. So that it's, it's a husk when Nebuchadnezzar shows up. So Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian, surrounds the city and in three waves takes people into deportation because Israel keeps rebelling. So in the first wave, he takes the nobles and the artisans. That's Daniel gets taken in that group. Um, almost certainly made a eunuch. He's put, given to the care of the chief of the eunuchs that suggests you're eunuch. He never gets married, never has kids. Danic was almost, Daniel was almost certainly made a eunuch by the Babylonians. Then um, in the next wave, they took a bunch of the people and dropped them into the countryside in Babylon. That's where Ezekiel is by the Kabar River. And then the final rebellion when Jehoiachin, or is it Zedekiah? I, I get the final kings of Israel confused. But they basically, they try to make a, because every time Nebuchadnezzar is like, look, will you guys just fall in line and do what I say? They're like, yeah, we will. Well, the last time, they tried to send down to Egypt to make a deal with Egypt so Egypt will come and help them. And, and Nebuchadnezzar finds out about it, and he just levels the city. And he takes the golden uh, vessels from the temple, destroys the temple, and then God humbles Nebuchadnezzar. He ends up writing Daniel chapter 4. But his own son, Balthazar, is the one who has the handwriting on the wall because he brings out the vessels from the temple and is getting drunk with them. And Anyway, so in Israel's history, they're deported. They're taken off the land by Nebuchadnezzar. And then seven years later, Cyrus, because the Babylonians get taken over by the Medo-Persians. And, the, and so Cyrus issues a proclamation releasing the people to go back to their land and to rebuild the temple, which is when Ezra and Nehemiah take place. 
the post-exilic period after the exile. And that is the temple that they're building that Jesus shows up to in Luke's gospel. After Herod the Great does a building and enlargement program on it. So basically, Israel's story is God calls Abraham, promises them a seed, a land, and a blessing, eventually gets a nation there out of the Exodus in the book of Joshua. That nation dwells for a while, eventually demands a king, gets a king. Very quickly, the kingdom splits. The north only rebels, gets warned, gets warned, gets warned, gets taken away. The south mostly rebels, gets warned, gets warned, gets warned, and gets taken away. Then they return, a feeble remnant, They begin to rebuild the temple, and they await for the coming of the Messiah. That's a brief overview of Israel's history. Um, Joshua and Gideon were not in the temple, I don't understand. That would be a good good concentration. So Joshua is the entrance into the land. The book of Joshua is when the people enter the land. Daniel prophesies the return from captivity to the land. So Daniel literally says he was reading the book of the prophet Jeremiah, and he, Jeremiah prophesies that the captivity will be 70 years, and basically Daniel says, Lord, it's been about 70 years. Tell me what's up next. And then God promises that he'll bring Israel back to the land. And then the books of Ezra and Nehemiah chronicle that actually taking place. We studied through the book of Zechariah, and Zechariah was the, the penultimate prophet sent to Israel to encourage the people in the rebuilding of the temple, to encourage the people in the reconstitution of the nation. Um, we're with Malachi, the Italian prophet. Malachi being the final <laughs> prophet who says he's coming, he's coming. And then the next movement is John the Baptist showing up in fulfillment of Malachi. Anyway, good question. Thank you. And uh, let's call it a day. God, oh, Simeon. Is it Mount Ebal? Is it Mount Ebal? No. Gerizim. Yes, thank you, Al. The alternate site of worship is Mount Gerizim. Thank you. The Mount, throw me, because it's the Mount of the Blessing, the Mount of the Curse. Anyway, God bless. Have a good day.